Amen. Let me take your seats. Philippians 2 and verses 5 to 11 tells us you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all names that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father give me Jesus. Amen. We're starting a new series today that will take us into the start of 2024 called Give Me Jesus. Looking at the life of Jesus, exploring what a life really looks like that would seek him first and seek first his kingdom. Who is this son of God? I think the danger can be that when I say to you, give me Jesus, your mind goes, I I know what that means, or I know who he is. And of course you do. But is there more to know of him? Is there a journey that God can take us on where we go deeper, where we understand him in different ways, where we get greater, greater revelation, whatever way some of you would understand that. Who is this Jesus? Who is this Son of God? Who do you say that he is? What does it really look like to say, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain? He must be pretty special, eh? <laughs> he must be pretty outstanding, eh? And the reality is the Holy Spirit, God the Father loves us, but he loves us too much, doesn't he, to leave us the way we are? What's he trying to do? He's trying to change us and conform us into the image of who? Of Jesus. And sometimes we're content with a lot less than that. Amen. (laughs) Sometimes we're so settled, aren't we? The routines and rhythms of life and all of this. Give me Jesus. That's what we'll explore together. In this passage in Philippians 2, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. And because of that, God gave him the name above all other names, that at his name, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Isn't that what God is at work on the earth today doing? Yeah. Sometimes we think, don't we? I wonder what God's up to today or what's going on. This is what he's doing. It looks like a million different ways, but this is what he is doing. Everyone say, give me Jesus. Philippians 3 and verses 7 to 11 describes him like this. I once thought these things were valuable, But now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. What does that look like? One with him. 
completely one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. Anyone pleased about that? For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. Give me Jesus. The Apostle Paul is describing in this passage, just before the verses I read, his titles and his role and his experience and who he has been. And he says, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Who is this Jesus that can make our titles and our positions and our experience seem worthless? because of what he has done, that he can come into our lives and take over in such a way that those things that the world values in such extreme measures, who is this Jesus that can come in? And it's as if it's worth nothing because of who he is. It's like he takes over. Give me Jesus. He says, yes, everything else is worthless. It's not actually that everything else is worthless, but it's worthless compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. That's that infinite word, right? That infinity. When we were kids, we wanted to talk about who knows the highest number ever, and we're like three trillion something, something, something. No, no, no. It's infinity. It's so big. It just cannot be compared or described or the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, who is this Jesus? For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. This is the only thing on Paul's agenda. This is the main thing as far as he is concerned. I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage because it is garbage. No, but because compared to him, compared to knowing him, it's all garbage, worthless. It's not worth pursuing or building your life around. Who is though? This Jesus. He is everything. It's like our entire lives are meant to be set up to go after this one thing. You are my one thing. Give me Jesus. I'm going after this. I'm pursuing this. I'm running after this. My whole of 2024, I want to be oriented around this. Give me Jesus. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. Who is this Jesus? Jesus certainly sounds like he is worth getting to know better, that he is worth being the longing of our hearts above anything else, that he has so much value and so much worth that I wouldn't even know where to begin to even try to describe his fullness, to try and describe the infinite value. I mean, I'll give it a go, but that he is so worthy of my worship that I can't help but throw up my hands and praise him again and again, that he is worth being the pursuit of my life. And what does verses 10 and 11 say in Philippians 3? I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. And we like that, don't we? And of course we do. We want to know him and experience his power. And then it goes on to say, I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. I get it. We can't think of even explore that today. We don't have time. But to go away and to consider that, that's how big, that's how worthy, that's how much value there is in knowing him. I want to suffer with him. Who loves someone so much that they want to suffer with them? They want to share in their suffering. It's almost hard to comprehend. So that one way or another, I'll experience the resurrection from the dead. Apparently, the Apostle Paul is leading the way here and saying to us, give me Jesus. Do you want to know him? Do you want to know him this year? Do you want to know him more? Then join us for the next couple of months 
and stripping off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up and run with endurance the race that God has set before us. How? By keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. What other passages of scripture come into your mind and heart as we think about parts of the Bible that are going to stir our souls to say, give me Jesus? I wonder if you could think about that at the start of a new year. And some of you have already had a bad week, I'm sure, on the first week. And just to remind you, there'll be more bad weeks to come, I'm sure. But give me Jesus. Amen. And the good weeks will come too, won't they? And some of you have probably had a fantastic week. And yet still, give me Jesus. It's not about my desire for a good week or a bad week. My desire for all the T's to be crossed and the I's to be dotted. Not my desire for all the ducks to be in a row. Everything to look good in my life. It's about whatever it is. Give me Jesus. Whatever way it's going, give me Jesus. So today, just briefly, we're going to look specifically at sort of the beginning of this. Jesus, the extraordinary child. We've obviously looked at his birth over a number of weeks and the different factors of that over the Christmas period. And thank you to all the people that preached um, in the month of December as well. And then thanks to Luke, the writer of the Gospel of Luke, we're able to see that Jesus as a boy was also extraordinary. Not just his birth, but as a boy. Let's read together from Luke chapter 2 and verses 39 to 52. And this is what it says. When Jesus' parents had fulfilled all the requirements of the law of the Lord, they returned home to Nazareth in Galilee. There the child grew up healthy and strong. He was filled with wisdom and God's favor was on him. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When Jesus was 12 years old, they attended the festival as usual. After the celebration was over, they started home to Nazareth. But Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't miss him at first because they assumed he was among the other travelers. But when he didn't show up that evening, they started looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they couldn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem to search for him there. Three days later, they finally discovered him in the temple, sitting among the religious teachers, listening to them and asking questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. His parents didn't know what to think. Son, his mother said to him, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantic, searching for you everywhere. But why did you need to search, he asked. Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he meant. Then he returned to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. And his mother stored all these things in her heart. Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all the people. When they couldn't find him, some of you are going, I didn't or wouldn't parent like that. (laughs) We can tell that there are some cultural things in this, of course. But yet still, it's a fascinating story, right? And of all we get to hear, why this snippet of his childhood? Are there some things to learn? This account gives us a little insight into these sections of Jesus' life that we really otherwise wouldn't know much about. But the Holy Spirit wanted it recorded in the Gospel of Luke, this particular account of Jesus' childhood. We're left with plenty of questions still, but what an interesting little story for us to wrestle with for a brief moment today and to think about. So Jesus and his parents have gone to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When it was over, they started home to Nazareth, but Jesus stays behind in Jerusalem and his parents didn't miss him at first. But where was Jesus? Where was the perfect, sinless son of God? He was in the temple sitting among the religious teachers, listening to them and asking questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. 
And his parents then asked the question that most of us do, probably wrongly, why have you done this to us? <laughs> Anyone else? When your kids do something wrong, why have you done this to me? Why have you embarrassed me? Why have you? Yeah, yeah, we've all something to learn, I know, me too. In Jesus' response, we get this little glimpse into his understanding of being the son of God. Because Jesus replies with, why did you need to search? Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? Okay, pause for a second. Because it starts to get a little bit confusing, doesn't it? Because your mother and father have been searching for you, but you were in your father's house. Jesus is revealing some stuff here, isn't he? Your father and I have been searching for you. Frantic. I was in my father's house. What is Jesus saying? They didn't understand what he meant. He returned to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother stored all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and with all of the people. Just two points from this today. And the first one is this. The all-knowing wise one. As we consider what it looks like to say, give me Jesus with our lives. We can see from this story that even as a young boy, he stood out for his knowledge and his wisdom. He has stayed behind in Jerusalem as his parents are starting home to Nazareth. And what is he doing? He's in the temple, sitting among the religious teachers. He's listening to them and he's asking questions. Of course he is. Verse 47, and all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. The all-knowing wise one, even as a child, and the religious leaders, teachers are amazed at this boy's understanding and his answers. Even the way he is going about this interaction is so wise, right? He is doing what? He is listening to them and he is asking questions. This is one of the best lessons that you will ever learn about how to interact with other people, to listen and to ask questions. This is something we all need to learn and get better at, right? listening and asking questions. And here is Jesus as a boy demonstrating his knowledge and his wisdom in his understanding and his answers and even in how he is going about this interaction. Why is this so amazing to me? Because if I was the son of God who had arrived on the scene on the planet of earth, I can imagine how much I just might want everyone to know just how special I was <laughs> announcing, do you know who I am? Why are you surprised that at 12 years old I know all of this? I am the son of God. But of course, this is not how Jesus goes about this, is he? Maybe you could imagine it would be quite hard to get used to getting through to the humans or something. You know, maybe he's trying to figure some of this out along the way. But here is the all-knowing wise one as a boy listening and asking questions and they are amazed at this boy's understanding and his answers can you imagine if we pulled a 12 year old boy are you 12 Owen almost yeah you are 12. yeah pulled Owen up the front and we start letting him ask questions and and all the rest and then he comes out with something like this right we're impressed with you Owen anyway so don't worry but like something like this it's striking isn't it striking the size Striking, we're not something we expect to come out of a 12-year-old boy's mouth. And yet Jesus, we're not going to expect to be amazed at the answers or the understanding or the way that he's going about it. And yet we are. And here he is today for you, Jesus. Here to listen. Here to ask questions. And if we will take the time to have a conversation with him through the Holy Spirit, we will be amazed at his understanding and his answers. Not just his answers, but in the way that he goes about it. Romans 2 and verse 4 says, Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? If you're here today or listening online and you're not following Jesus, can I remind you today that his approach to you is wonderfully kind and tolerant and patient 
and loving his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Doesn't this reminder make us want to cry out, give me Jesus? That's what I want. That's the approach that I want in my life in a world filled with difficult human interactions and often a lack of understanding and a lack of listening and a lack of asking questions. Give me Jesus, the all-knowing, wise one who is so wonderfully kind and tolerant and patient that in order to help us understand, he listens and asks questions. Give me Jesus. The stories of this amazing child born and whose birth is celebrated at Christmas time is growing up as a young boy and it is already evident that he is in fact the son of God. We can see it at 12 years old. Give me Jesus whose understanding and answers at 12 years old are already amazing. The religious teachers who there is nothing that he cannot help me with in my life and my situation. Give me Jesus, amen, the all-knowing wise one. Maybe you need some help today. Maybe you need some help for 2024. Would you turn to him? Would you allow him to listen to you? That also means feel free to have your say. <laughs> whatever you need to get out, whatever you need to say to him, say it, he will listen. Then will you listen to his questions. He's going to allow you to talk some more. Isn't that amazing? We don't just have to sit in front of him all the time and just say, gimme, 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 tell me off, whatever. Jesus, here's all the things that I think. Listen, oh, he might ask a question, very surprised that. And I think you'll be very surprised at how he asks the questions. But allow him to speak that wisdom into your life in the various ways that he does that. And then watch as the all-knowing wise one has the best understanding and the best answers. Because, of course, he made us. He knows us better than anyone else. Give me Jesus. Secondly, we see his example of obedience. Jesus' parents show up in the scene. Why have you done this to us? How many parents, again, need this reminder to not take everything our kids do so personally. Is that helpful for someone today? It was helpful for me, so I'll throw it out there. Jesus wasn't doing anything to them, was he? No. Also interesting to ask the question, if this was the first time that Mary had to correct the Son of God, <laughs> is that why this is included in this? The sinless Son of God? And on a side note, how frustrating must it have been to raise a perfect child? thought about that as I was reading this this week. I was like, oh, he always knows best, you know, like that. That must have been hard for a play, Mary. A constant reminder that they are sinless and you are not. So here's Jesus' mother trying to correct him. And Jesus responds with two questions. But mom, why did you need to search? Didn't you know that I would be in my father's house. Mary has literally just mentioned your father and I have been frantic and Jesus reminds her of who he really is in this question. Didn't you know that I would be in my father's house? It wasn't Joseph's house, was it? He's talking about father God. I'm actually with my father in his house and doing his work. I'm the son of God, mom. She didn't understand what he meant, but he returned to Nazareth with them. And what does it say? He was obedient to them. He grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and all the people. In spite of him knowing that he was the son of God, in spite of his clear brilliance at 12 years of age, of his understanding and his answers and his wisdom and his dealings, his sinlessness, he obeyed his parents and returned to Nazareth with them. Even at 12 years old, Jesus is a perfect example of obedience. Give me Jesus. He was setting an example for us as he knew that a life of obedience would be best for us too. Surely in this moment he could have persuaded Mary that maybe he should stay and his ministry could begin because at 12 years old they're already amazed at his understanding and his answers but he obeyed because he knew that he would ask us to obey too, wouldn't he? He would ask us to hear his teaching and obey like a person who builds their house 
on the rock. He would ask the wind and the waves even to obey him. He would ask us to teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that he has given. Evil spirits even would obey his orders. The demons would obey when the, se- the 72, even when his name was used. And of course, Jesus would attach love to obedience, which is not always people's understanding, is it? Of obeying. John 14 and verse 15, if you love me, obey my commandments. Love attached, attached to obedience. Don't just obey me because I'm a big, scary, authoritative figure, or I know so much more than you, or I'm so much better than you, or whatever. Obey me because you love me. And you love me because I loved you first. Jesus returned to Nazareth and was obedient to them because love was the center of everything he did. And he was the perfect example of obedience because he was going to ask all of his followers to spend the rest of their lives obeying him because love is at the center of obedience in the kingdom of God. Give me that. Give me that type of obedience, Jesus. Give me that type of love. Give me Jesus. So I wonder today, would you go on a journey with us over the next couple of months and saying, give me Jesus. There's so much more to unpack. All we've really looked at today is a 12-year-old boy's interaction one time in the temple with religious teachers. And already we see how incredible that he is. I wonder over the next couple of months, would you have another look at the Gospels and just rediscover one more time who he is and how amazing that he is, that we could cry out together as a church, give me Jesus. Let's stand together. And I wonder if you just ask him again, if you just talk to him again, maybe in this moment, You need to say some things to him so that he can listen, so that he can ask you some questions. Feel free to do that in the quietness in this moment. We're gonna worship together as well. I just invite you to interact with Jesus in this moment. You'll be amazed at his understanding and his answers.